We're here with Anna Kwan. Anna, thank you so much for being here. Um, we're going to be talking about your novel, Low. And the first thing I wanted to ask about is about writing about trauma. This is a novel about a really exceptional protagonist, Adriana Song, um, who ends up in the Nova Scotia Hospital, a psychiatric hospital. And I wondered if you could tell us why it was important to you to write a novel about this experience. Uh, well, <clears throat> I myself am a person that identifies as mad or a person with psychiatric experiences I've come fond, become fond of saying. Um, I, Before I wrote my first novel, Migration Songs, I was thinking I'd like to set a novel in the Nova Scotia Hospital and write about the, the experience of being in there and um, what brings you in there and what you feel like in there and what you feel like coming out of there. So um, uh, that was why, the, but I wrote my first novel because I wanted to tell a story that didn't necessarily have to do with mental health. It was just a story that I wanted to write um, that would kind of, to start out as a writer, not as a writer with uh, mental health or mental illness issues or whatever you want to call it. So Low was written um, second, my second novel, and um, I really wanted just to, I wanted that not to write that novel f sort of even further back than Migration Songs. So, um, and it's very close to my heart in ways that um, my other novels maybe aren't so close to my heart because it's so um, close to my experience in the, in the psych hospital. Yeah. And, and I'll say as someone who also identifies as mad and who has spent many, many, many months in psych wards, um, it really resonated with me. Um, mm -hmm. And I just, I felt so grateful that you wrote this novel and that you wrote it with such compassion for the characters. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Um, so the trauma you write about in the novel is so significant. A young woman has lost her mother um, eight years previously. She has an estranged, much younger sister who went to live with an aunt after the mother died. She's biracial. Um, she goes through a major clinical clinical depression, and she also has psychotic features with the clinical depression. So for me, your representation of depression, especially the the really amazing descriptions of excess sleep, which which really resonated with me, um, and of psychosis, which starts with Adriana's visions of her dead mother, and they seem really innocent at the novel's beginning. Um, but then they become more important in understanding her psychosis. But then we also see her move through paranoia about her hospital food being potentially tampered with and paranoia about her hospital room being monitored by cameras or other recording devices. So these are really powerful and vivid and, and I'll say highly relatable experiences. Um, so I was wondering what you were hoping to achieve with this really realistic account of what it is to go through mental health issues, particularly in a clinical setting? Yeah, well, I guess part of it was, I, I, I will say I haven't had that sort of paranoia. I've had other, other kinds of tinges of suspiciousness, but not, not, that, not those specific things. Um, but what I wanted to show, I think, was that um, there is kind of a progression for one thing, uh, how symptoms unfold, so you want to call them symptoms. I, I, I have sort of mixed feelings about the term mental illness and, you know, but, um, the progression of this, uh, the unfolding of this unwellness. Um, and also there's a kind of logic in it, like, um, I mean, some people think, oh boy, that's a really far out thought, but there's some kind of lead up to it. There's some kind of relationship to other things. So Adriana's paranoia and her psychosis very much related to her 
um, difficult relationship with her mom when she was alive and stems from, so stems from kind of, um, I think an urge, maybe unconscious, subconscious or unconscious to sort that out. So I sort of see psychosis as having a purpose in a way, like, I mean, it's difficult, of course, and I don't really want to go there, <laughs> but it's not a totally out of the blue kind of thing that has no relationship to anything else. It does have relationship to, to other things, the content and maybe the, um, the form of psychosis, like not everyone will develop it, but I think it, it probably has a reason for being there. What I'm trying to say <laughs> to ramble a little bit. <laughs> well, and it yeah, it, it speaks to our kind of subconscious anxieties a little bit, mm -hmm. and those don't always show up as psychosis, as you're saying. But for Adriana, they do, um, and I think this this repeated vision she has of her mother standing in judgment of her, like literally standing in a in a doorway in judgment of her. Um, is directly related to the trauma she experienced with her mother, both when she was alive and then as a result of her early death. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it makes, as you're saying, it makes sense that the features of the psychosis that she experiences are, are in fact understandable. Um, they, they make sense for what she's gone through as a child. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, I think sometimes people's psychosis has a religious kind of, has overtones or very explicit overtones sometimes. And about the, you know, and I've met a lot of people that had pretty strict religious upbringings in, in the psych hospital and their, their psych, their preoccupations can be about guilt and about, you know, fear of after death and so definitely I I see them I see the connection between the expression of these um of this illness if you want to call it illness or whatever you want to call it, this experience as being related yeah to something that came before so you were asking about why um, why I wanted to portray this um a realistic experience of it. And I think it's because it's partly to demystify it for people <laughs> in some way. Although I think, you know, not people aren't going to relate to it necessarily, but if you can see there's a little bit of a through line between someone's childhood and what they experience in psychosis, you think, oh yeah, like there is, it's not like just someone dreaming of blue Martians or something, you know, like it's not just totally fantastical. So anyway, I think, <laughs> I think you get that. <laughs> yeah. And that's a good point about the, the non fantastical nature of it, because I think some people would think of psychosis as a like division between fantasy and reality, but it's not about fantasy versus reality. It's about something much more complex than that in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> and I yeah. say in my mind, cause I <laughs> through it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're on the same page there. <laughs> kind of get it, yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask you about your influences when you were writing this, because I'm thinking about, um, uh, you know, Girl Interrupted and those kinds of representations of especially like women's it, experiences of, of madness or whatever we want to call it. Um, but also about someone like Lynn Cody, who wrote Strange Heaven, which is also set in Halifax, partially anyway, Cape Breton in Halifax, where the, the protagonist ends up in the psych ward in Halifax. Um, and she's also about the same age as Adriana. And so I just wondered if you were thinking about those while you were writing or if it was it was more based on autobiographical experiences. Um, well, I, I did see Girl Interrupted and was a bit strongly affected by it. I know that I know it's not totally unproblematic as a portrayal of um madness and experience in the men in the psych hospital. I haven't read uh Stranger Strange Heaven, Stranger yes. Heaven. Strange I, Heaven. Which I must read now. But <clears throat> in fact, I think you know when I was first depressed when I was 16 or so, 
I stopped reading for pleasure. And um, even though I did an English degree after that, I haven't read a whole lot of books since I was a kid, uh, to be very honest. My, so I would say my influences for, uh, for low were more my my personal experience and um and i think the scene with the um at the begin near the beginning with the psychic <laughs> who um himself ends up in in the psych hospital i um i that kind of um like my my interest in the occult or the mystical and the and and the spiritual side of things has also played into writing this book i think um but no direct literary influences yeah that's so interesting because for me this is such an important book about lived experience and um I feel like there are a lot of books that try to capture what it's like to be in a psych ward. And for me, they don't quite deliver. And this book really delivers for me. And mm -hmm. so I, I think it's interesting that you weren't trying to respond to literary precursors or anything. You were just like, no, <laughs> based on my own experience, this is what I want to write. And that, that makes sense to me for, for how the book unravels. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I feel a bit reassured by that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to get into some of the amazing details in the novel. Um, so I was struck by several things. One is that the novel is so utterly poetic in its style, but also really character driven. So we have Adriana as a focal character. We have her dad. We have her best friend, Jazz, and her sister, Beth, who are all supporting characters. And then we have all these psych ward figures who are really key figures as well. So we have the patients, the nurses, the doctors. I wonder if you can talk about this balance you've made between really lyrical prose and really hearty characters. Hmm. Thank you. I feel like you give me all these compliments. It's really nice to hear. It's been a long time since I've you know, been sort of intimately connected to low. So um, it's nice to rethink these things but um so I guess sometimes I think my style is a bit too <laughs> too poetic and I try to temper that with some sort of hard harder detail like harder real realism but um I always you know people fascinate me and I think I'm sure that's why a lot of novelists write novels is because people characters are so fascinating um and i just you know i think to me when i read a novel it's important to me that i feel like i can i can see and relate not relate but i can sort of understand the characters as real people or connect to them as real people um whether I like them or not, whether I agree with them or not, but they feel like they have their own existence. So I'm glad if I was able to do that a bit with my characters, um, some of them anyway. And I, I just like to honor the reality of those characters. So if I if it comes across in the writing, I'm really happy about that. So yeah, I'll say I, I found your portrayal of the psych ward figures particularly compassionate, um, especially the nurses. So I wondered if you wanted to talk about the characters of Fiona and Elspeth. Um, those are the two nurses that work most closely with Adriana in the hospital because they have really fascinating relationships, not just with Adriana, but also with other patients. So I'm thinking of when Elspeth spends time with Jeff at the Dartmouth General Hospital um, after he slashes his throat with a jar that Adriana had given him unknowingly or not knowing that he would use it as for self-harm. Um, but they are also have a, a role as kind of surrogate mothers for Adriana and clearly they help her heal from the trauma of her relationship with her mother. 
but they also have their own stories. So Fiona's own experience with her daughter's early motherhood and her daughter's depression, um, that also figures, I mean, we're, that's not revealed until late in the novel, but we know that there's something going on with one of those nurses. Uh, we just don't know who. So I was wondering if, if you were thinking about those nurses as catalysts for Adriana's recovery in a way that goes far beyond the stereotype of what a nurse can do to actually help a patient. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, in my experience in the psych hospital, the cleaners first, well, one particular cleaner was the most human, you know, sort of spark of light in the place. But the nurses, they were, they were kind, often funny, reassuring. The doctors were up here. They were a bit cold, often, you know, not, we didn't, I didn't connect with them. But the nurses that I saw time and again <laughs> as I went to the, nurse, the psych hospital several times in my um, 20s and, and 30 and 40, 40s um, were, you know, they, they were, I remember one nurse saying, you know, if you, you know, Anna, when you, if you're, if you're going to be okay, just, it'll take a little time, but you're going to be okay. And she was so sure of that. And it really, I know it sounds really dinky, but I, I believed her. I took the medication and the medication for me works like the one I'm on now works. And then, so I trusted her <laughs> and she was right. And, um, their calmness and their collectedness in the face of my, but also their their empathy in the face of my distress was always um, a source of comfort for me, even when I didn't connect with them very much, even when I had sort of mixed feelings about um, psych per service providers, the nurses were always people that were a bit of a comfort to me and um in the 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 novel i wanted to show that but also to sh to acknowledge that they are real people and that adriana's um and my perception of them as having oh this person's so happy this person has a good job this person is you know not in my situation um but they also have their own difficult lives to lead. And so I wanted I wanted to acknowledge their humanity, I guess, and their humanness by giving Fiona this bit of a, a story of, about her own difficult life. Elspeth was more had I don't think I revealed much too much about her story. And she was like <laughs> Uh, like one of the patients who I'd actually met in the psych hospital, a bit of a grandmother figure for me. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't had much contact with my own grandmothers. Um, so I like the idea of this older woman who's wise and calm and has a grasp of <laughs> things that I, I don't necessarily have a grasp of as being... Um, a, a friend, a figure of friendship and caring, and um, uh, so yeah, I don't know if that answered the question. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit blabby today. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, no, you did answer the question because they it, it's through that idea of compassion and empathy and friendship that I think these nurses come alive to Adriana, too. Um, and we get this sense that. Someone like Fiona, who, as you say, appears to Adriana initially as this very polished, put together, you know, well, well-to-do woman who probably Adriana muses, I think that she probably has this perfect life outside of the hospital and is able to just set the hospital aside, go home and not have to think about it afterwards. And that of course is not at all what her situation is. Um, and so to humanize those nurses in a way that gives them a connection to the work they're doing because of what they're experiencing in their own lives, but also gives them a connection to Adriana because she finally sees that, no, it's, it's not as 
polished and perfect as it seems is really important, I think. Um, but it's also this, this sense that those nurses are these maternal figures or, or maybe grandmotherly figures in Elspeth's case, um, who help Adriana heal that mother wound, right? Um, and I think that's so key that it's the, the women in the ward who heal that mother wound for her. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and I think uh, most of the psych nurses that I came across were women. There were a couple of men, but um, the ones I related to the most were women. The ones that I gravitated to were women. And I think that's a very good point that they're healing her mother wound. And I hadn't really framed it that way, but that is the case, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's really important. Um, but along with the nurses, we also have these really incredible and memorable patient characters in the hospital. So I just want to talk about a few of those. Um, so we have Marlene, who for me was really recognizable as a, a particular type of psych ward patient, but also as very much her own self. Um, then we have Reggie and Jeff and Melvin. And then, of course, Samantha towards the end um of the novel so the thing that strikes me is that they're each really much their own individuals and they're really well-rounded to me and that seems very different from what we tend to get in representations of psych wards in popular media um i'm thinking of like one flew over the cuckoo's nest we just you know you get these terrible stereotypes of of what these psych ward patients are like and it never moves beyond that. So what was it to, like to write these characters? And what did you want to achieve through their, their portrayals? So for instance, Reggie and Jeff are kind of tragic figures, um, but they're also really beautifully complex. And then Samantha is a transgender woman who seems to be treated quite well in terms of gender affirming care at the hospital in that she's given a one a room in a woman's uh ward um there isn't a lot of question about who she is in terms of being a woman um we have this really brief moment where adriana reacts in kind of disbelief and a bit of horror when she when samantha discloses that she's trans um but that also moves quite quickly out of Adriana's scope and she she considers Samantha a really good friend. Um, so I just wondered what you wanted to achieve with some of those characters in giving them these very full and rich lives that we don't normally see represented in, mm -hmm. in I don't know what you wanna call them, like narratives about mental health. Yeah, well, um... So in the psych hospital, I met many people. I did not meet, these are not drawn from characters that I met. They're kind of invented people. But um, what struck me in the psych hospital was, was even though people had had great, were in great distress sometimes, had had terrible lives full of neglect and abuse and lives that do not that I cannot compare mine to they were kind often kind to each other and supportive of each other and I wanted to show that um that, that was the case and that friendships develop between those pa between patients um that um they are you no know, we we are psych patients are people that have Whole stories, and um, I guess that was though that was the main reason I wanted to to write them the way I did. I did not actually have experience of it um, with a trans patient myself, like a fr trans friend in the hospital, and it just strikes me that I didn't know much about trans people at that time. Like I never really. Um, had much connection to what is what I now see as a community. Like that was when I wrote that it was two thousand. It was two thousand thirteen. It was published, 
but I had read a book called Conundrum, I think, which was a, a, a autobiography of a tennis player who became who who transitioned to um, womanhood, and I found it fascinating. And it also that book, so that's one one. Um, literary influence, I guess. That book made me um, start thinking about gender in a different way, I guess. Um, and so I know um, some of the things that Samantha, the character of Samantha says and are probably not what a trans person would necessarily say. Like she does mention that she's, um, felt like she was born in the wrong body. And I don't think a lot of trans people would, would necessarily say it that way now, but um, but that's what, so anyway, she, I, so I never met a trans person to know closely. And I wanted to explore, explore that in my own head, I guess, um, with this book before I knew very much. So I'm, um, <laughs> I hope I hope it comes across well. Like I just I wasn't sure about that part, but I know other people have said, uh, including a young trans friend that I had um, a few years back, said that they liked they liked the book low, and I I knew they accepted my depiction of this character, so that relieved me <laughs> in a way. So. Yeah, and, and you're sounding critical of, of your representation, maybe because it was a while ago now, but actually Samantha as a character is over 60. And so it would actually make sense that she might herself have a different view of transness than right. how we think about or talk about trans identity now. So I think, yeah. I think that's also a point to make. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. And, you know, the, the point about her being a, a trans woman in a woman's room in the unit, like it's not something that occurred to me at the time that that might not happen <laughs> in 2000, well, early 2000s. I don't know whether it would have happened, but my assumption is he, he was, um, he had had bottom surgery to be quite blunt. And that, that I mean, I wasn't sure where else they would want to, where they would put her. She's a, I mean, and I don't know whether the psychosocial would regard her as a woman or not, but it it made sense to me that she would be with other women. So, yeah, yeah I don't know what. That's, yeah. that's probably a topic for a whole other conversation. It sure is. <laughs> because yeah. I think, I think there are a lot of trans people who've had terrible experiences in psych wards, yeah. as well as in prisons, the prison system, yes. you know, any institution that makes divisions based on a binary is going to be problematic for anyone who's gender non-conforming. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that's probably a different conversation. Yeah. But I really appreciated <laughs> that you had a, you know, a, a, a significant trans character who was just treated um, as one of one of the other patients and and it wasn't it wasn't a big deal. Um, and it, it was, um, some, something to be almost celebrated as it is in the, in the news item at the end of the novel. Um, right. so I, I really appreciated that. Um, well, I, I'm glad. And I don't know if it's realistic, but it was what seemed realistic to me at the time. So it's what got in the novel. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we also have Vera, Adriana's mother. So she's a significant character, but she's absent because she's yeah. passed on. Um, and I wondered how you dug into that mother-daughter tension to develop their relationship in the, through this absence. Um, like, was it crucial that the mother be dead in order for Adriana to metaphorically bond with her? Um, that's That was one of the questions I had reading it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think Adriana's mother um, died partly because my own mother's mother died when she was a young girl. And I was 
you know, I, Vera, the character of Vera was influenced by my my mother and by my idea of her relationship with her mother who had died. And I think, um, so that's where that, why in the novel she had died, I think, part because it reflects um, something out of my own ancestry. Um, whether or not it was important, like I think it would have been more, there would have been a lot more um, difficulty writing about the stuff going on in Adriana's own head if her mother had also been alive as a real person. Mm -hmm. Like I think she wouldn't have had the same, it wouldn't have been the same story for sure. Yeah. And she wouldn't have had the same experience. Um, yeah. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> no, I that. agree. I agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. When I said your novel is poetic, I really meant it. <laughs> um, the metaphors and imagery are really stunning and they return again and again, kind of like light motifs in a symphony. They just keep coming back up. So I'm thinking in particular of the sea imagery. Um, so there's a lot of Adriana imagining or comparing things to sea creatures, to um, uh, seashells, to ocean life, that kind of thing. For instance, she imagines the hippocampus of the brain as a seahorse, and that comes up as a recurring image. Um, we also see repeated similes comparing the brain to whirlpools. Um, and then Adriana pictures herself as a starfish in a tidal pool while she's splayed in her hospital bed. So there's all these amazing images of sea life or ocean life. And I just wondered, was it important to you to use the sea as a metaphor for a novel set in Dartmouth um, as, as someone living in Nova Scotia or, and what else was going on with the sea, the sea imagery? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I've had other people ask me about this uh, sea, um, underwater sea and water imagery comes very naturally to me. So um, it's not certainly conscious, a conscious thing that I'm talking about you know, uh, is that it's an all of a sudden Dharmas by the sea, so I'm using this imagery. It just comes naturally to me. <laughs> and I, I think it's partly because of my cancer and partly because I've lived here all my life near the sea and partly um, because the experience of that Adriana had and that I've had is, uh, I feel almost like it's an, being underwater, like the depression and psychosis is something that makes me feel submerged in something. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, I guess, the, the answer to that. Yeah, yeah, and there's also one point where Adriana is described as looking like a drowned woman uh, because she's so pale and her eyes are blackened under the, under the eyes and, and she's, she's just so unhealthy looking um from the depression and not eating and that kind of thing um and i just i found that idea of you know occupying a space in a different realm completely it is what it feels like to have depression or psychosis or depression and psychosis um and and i think you captured it really well through that imagery of functioning in a different a different atmosphere or a different biosphere, really. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm i glad. And I, I hope, you know, sometimes people ask me about metaphors and images I use, and really they're just what comes to me. And I don't have any real strategy or like involved with it. But I think when I was writing this novel, um, I was conscious of the, um, the, um, the water imagery. Um, uh, and particularly of the hippocampus as a sea seahorse, like I think hippopotamus is a river horse. Like hippo, <laughs> hippo is a horse. I think anyway, hippopotamus is like a river horse. And I was thinking of that, um, uh, you know, that that the hippocampus is shaped 
this way, but also, um, you know, I sea creatures for me are quite um, the closest thing to aliens that I know of. And um, so I guess partly when I want to portray something as having some mysteriousness or alienness about it, including stuff in my own brain and body, sea imagery fits the bill. That makes so yes. much sense. Yeah, I really like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we have Hurricane Juan figure in. So this mm -hmm. is both a kind of incidental plot point, but also a climax in the novel. Um, so the patient Jeff agonizes over the weather throughout his time in the psych ward. Um, but then when the, when Juan is known to be arriving, he he really starts to lose it, let's say. Yeah. Um, but it's Reggie who ends up dying in the harbor during mm -hmm. Juan. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about the symbolic use of a natural disaster to represent the storms inside us. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'll say, you know, I tend to write um, my novels that I've written about Joan and, and Migration Thomas and Adriana have always come a little after, um, like, in the case of Migration Songs, it was the bombing of the um, World Trade Center Towers in New York, in this case, um, Hurricane Juan, and um, it was, you know, I remember during Hurricane Juan thinking about what was happening in different places in the city. And one of them was the Nova Scotia Hospital. When I wondered if windows blew in and, you know, all this kind of thing. Um, I think uh, as far as like internal storms go, it's, um, I wouldn't, I, I don't know that there's a direct correlation ex um, in this book, it was a it's a plot point, but it's also a point about the setting. And um, um, I guess it was I I wanted to show how people would react in kind of heroic or not so heroic ways in this kind of situation, you know, and that that people in the psych hospital might have, like Reggie's sense of wanting to stop the hurricane was obviously, you know, it's not it's not a real thing that he was going to stop the hurricane, it's in his own hand. But that heroic impulse was, it's kind of something that people can relate to who, whether, wherever they have been, wherever in life they have passed through. And psych patients are no different that way. And then um, um, Jeff's fear of the the storm being enough to make him want to end his own life. Um, uh, well, the sorry, I, I know I'm not really coherent here, but I, I once was a daycare teacher, and there was a little girl who was afraid of rain, and that's where I got his fear of rain from I didn't had never realized that could be a fear before I met this little girl so Jeff had that fear and I guess for him the fear was so great and that it made him want to stop living um and I think that there are fears out there of things both real and not real that give us that um, that kind of uh, reaction, not and not just fear, but like a experiences that are well traumatic enough, and he saw trauma coming from this because he was afraid of the rain. He saw it as a trauma coming to him that he wanted to um, end his conscious existence. So um, I I have, so in my own experience with suicidation, suicidal ideation, 
um, I have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of hopelessness and a lot of fear for the future, I guess, is partly what it is, like fear that something will never end in my case. Um, so I, so anyway, I'm sorry, I don't think I'm answering this question very well, but I think Jeff, um, Jeff's reaction is extreme and fearful. And that, of course, there are many things in life that we react to this way too. And this storm is just maybe a picture of, in it, a metaphor for the things that we can't control that are bigger than than us that are outside our control, um, and that we feel we have to escape from, that we can't put ourselves through them. Um, yeah, does that make any sense? At that, all? <laughs> that makes complete sense because the idea of something being completely outside our control is one of the scariest things for us, right? Yeah, and particularly if you're having, um you know, phobic experiences or, or paranoid experiences, any of those experiences that, that are called symptoms, um, they, they do tend to be often about more imagined fears than, than real fears. Whereas one is, is not an imagined fear, right? One is, one is a real fear that is actually going to devastate Halifax. Um, and, and so to make it, uh, to make this, big storm that did in fact traumatize the region um into a metaphor for all of those fears that these patients tend to have and to see their reactions to that fear i i thought was a really interesting way of bringing in something that actually happened in in the area um and relating it to these psych ward patients in a in a really you know a really evocative way because they all have such different reactions. Like Adriana just sleeps through it, right? She's able to sleep through the storm. Um, and that's, that's kind of typical of her trauma response, which is that her trauma response is, is to sleep, to avoid. Um, whereas as you say, Jeff's trauma response is to escape. So self-harm is, is almost always what he goes to. He's got that suicidal ideation really strongly. Um, and Reggie's is to, you know, go fight full force, which we see even from the very beginning where he's marching out of the psych ward just to go have a smoke, but he's, he's like addressing Mr. Song as chairman Mao, you know, <laughs> like, he, so we have this, this sense that each of their individual psyches are responding in, in very individualistic ways to, to the, perceived or real traumas that they're experiencing right you said that so much better than me <laughs> but yes that is right. yeah. um i also want to talk about this amazing metaphor that adriana comes up with where she she's talking about people's brains first her own and then other people's clicking along like beads in an abacus um and this image pops up quite a few times in the novel and it was really uh really stunning to me because that it's not just a visual image it's a sonic image as well like that clicking of beads on an abacus is such a vivid portrayal of what it might be like to imagine a brain in distress trying to add things up and not able to add them up but desperately at trying to use the tools it has available to it such as an abacus um, so I'm just wondering if you can talk about like what that abacus is for you. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure of the history of the abacus, but I've seen it and imagined it being used in these little stores in Chinatown and, um, you know, in Toronto or somewhere. Um, and I, so it's, a. And I always, I don't know how an abacus works. Like I've been, tr someone tried to teach me, but I never quite got it. So I see it as a, it's a tool that there's a certain franticness about it for me because I don't know how to use it. It makes a lot of noise and I don't know what the noises mean and there's things moving and I don't know, I don't know what they mean. So um, it's a little bit 
opaque for me, but um, so there's that franticness and the uh, incomprehensibility of it, but also that it, as you said, it's a tool that some people can use to figure things out, but I have it in my hands and I can't, I hear it, I see it, and I can't figure out what it's all about. So it's, for me, it's like the brain become has become something that I should be able to use, but can't, and it frightens me at the same time. So, um, yeah, and the, the fact that the beads on the abacus are dark, that kind of is reflective of my view of depression, just those dark little things that, um, it could be my own thoughts, I guess, clicking together, there's a little gleam coming off them, but they're kind of, you know, they're not transparent. You can't see through them. You can't. Anyway, <laughs> it's it just seems to work for me, that image, for those reasons, I guess. Yeah, and they don't add up, right? They don't add up. <laughs> That's what yeah. some people do. <laughs> yeah, for me, for someone, they do, right? If they know how, if they can use that tool, but not for me. <laughs> Well, and it's also interesting to choose a tool that Adriana herself can't use, right? And so for her, it is a metaphor yeah. for a brain or a mind that's not working as, yes. as it could be. Um, yes. And I'm also interested in the the sort of the the black beads as symbolic of depression because I'm sure you've seen that book and and short film. It's an animated film about the black dog of depression. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's what people almost always use as the metaphor for the central metaphor for what depression feels like is to have this dog that just needs you all the time and weighs you down and follows you everywhere. Um, but I much prefer the black beads of an abacus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, yeah, yeah, I can see why I, I prefer it too. It's more real to me, the abacus, than a dog. Yeah. Well, and a dog is is a bit reductive, right? It it's oversimplified. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a question about the in between in the novel. So Adriana talks a few times about being caught in between places or worlds or situations. Um, so between uh, imagination or psychosis and the reality that she's facing. She's also talks about being caught between the patient world and the civilian world where she's wearing street clothes in the unit, but she also has a Johnny shirt over like a bathrobe. Um, and so she's like actually reifying completely what it feels like to be caught between those two worlds. And she also escapes a couple of times and, and is therefore a patient out in the world and, and kind of caught between two worlds. So I'm wondering what in betweenness in this novel, or maybe in terms of madness means for you. Yeah, I mean, I guess when I think about that, I think Adriana came from being not a mental patient to being a mental patient to going to not be a mental patient again, which is the experience of most people who go through the psych hospital. I mean, we do maintain some of us like that we're still mad or still, you know, identify that way. But um, I there is no clear line between patient, between inpatient and person out there in the world. Like, to, for me, there's no clear line in my life that way. Um, so I guess I, when Adriana experiences that, um, I wanted to show that, I want to show the ambiguity of it, like that there is no uh, clear division between these worlds in some way. And yet there is, I mean, there is this, the stigma of being in a psych hospital will follow a person for the rest of their life sometimes. And um, so in some minds there is, but in reality, that is maybe not, not, not my, not my experience. Does that, 
does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that totally makes sense because there's this idea of, um, as you said, as if there is a clear distinction between someone who is a psych patient and someone who is not. But what people don't realize is that you probably know a bunch of people who have been psych patients and you just don't know about it because of the stigma, because people don't talk about it as much. Um, and you brought up stigma and I wanted to talk about that um, for sure today because uh, in a more general sense, I feel like writing about mental illness is especially important right now. I feel like with the onset of the pandemic and the ongoing pandemic, life has kind of deepened and broadens people's awareness of mental health issues and maybe a, a need for stories about mental illness. And so I just wonder what you think about um, how these kinds of stories are being received and, and maybe being produced or generated now in, at a time when stigma, I would suggest is maybe being reduced a little bit. You know, I, I don't know, to be honest, like I, for, in, on a number of friends, I don't know, um, about how many stories are being generated. There, you're probably right. There's probably a lot out there. Um, stories, you mean fiction or stories of real people or? Like I, any, any, I would say. Stories? Yeah. Because yeah. when, I, when I think about the reactions to the housing crisis, and um, I think, you know, there's kind of polarized views of it. Some people are very... Um, empathetic and compassionate to the people who don't have homes or and the people on the streets who are more maybe a little more visible now than they were at one time certainly the encampments are more visible here in Halifax and Dartmouth um on the other hand there are people that are like you know um who are the opposite of that so I wonder if I mean, definitely, I think the COVID has created more mental health, mental health issues among the general population. Uh, whether I don't know if it translates to the experience of um, people going through the psych hospital and coming out and you know, what, I don't know, to be honest. I'm always a little bit um, careful and a bit skeptical of the idea of stigma being reduced. I know it, I know that education and storytelling has helped. And I don't know whether I guess I just have seen on people's faces, oh, you've been in the psych hospital. And I see it. I see the change in their face to me. So I know that hasn't been erased. Um, yeah, yeah, I definitely don't think it's been erased. I will, I will say that. And like, when I say reduced, I might mean marginally reduced. Um, because I, I agree. I, I have definitely had the same experiences where people find out I've been in the psych ward multiple times and there is a, a very different interpretation of who I am after they find that out. Um, and I find that especially at the workplace, I would say it's, it's far worse in the work environment and in the um, in the professional sphere than it is just in in my everyday life. And I th I think the irony is that workplaces think that they're doing so much to help employee mental health, and they're not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that's true. And I think there's certain hierarchies. Like maybe there's more people who subscribe to the idea of having depression and anxiety as being part of a normal human experience but psychosis i'm not so sure like i'm not sure people are there yet <laughs> but uh, yeah i think that's a great point because that also comes to the idea of treatment so like antidepressants have become more normalized in society and more accepted in society but for instance, I went through electroshock therapy. And when I talk about that, people are, are shocked. <laughs> they, yeah. they, 
they really can't believe that that's something that still happens in the 21st century. Um, and, and so I think you're right. There are hierarchies of what people will accept and what people will even believe, um, or are willing to believe and what people are willing to talk about as well, because it, it makes people so uncomfortable to talk about anything beyond, as you say, depression and anxiety, which I think you're right. They're, they're more accepted now as part of the spectrum of what we experience, um, mood wise. And, right. and I think it's become more common, especially with COVID to, for people to share stories of depression. But I think the kind of, you know, clinical depression that, that you represent in this novel is still not the kind of depression that people are normalizing. I wouldn't think. I think that's true. And I think there's a funny tendency like to want to say, Oh, I'm, I have this, but I'm not like that person. And I think it could be even more so for people maybe who have experienced depression or anxiety, but don't want to be labeled with the same label that people like you and I might, (laughs) might uh, subscribe to. Like I, it's interesting that people are this way um, to me that, but I, I, I get it in some respects. Like we all want to establish our own little piece of normalcy, normality, (laughs) normalcy, and say, we're okay, but maybe those people aren't okay. And I think there's a lot of fear involved in it and a lot of it. I don't think it's necessarily malicious. I think it's more fear-based on the part of people who don't want to say, oh, I'm not, I don't want to label myself with the same label as people with psychosis. And I get that. I was a person without depression and psychosis once. I didn't want, I was afraid of being mad as a kid. I was afraid of going mad. That was one of my big fears and it has happened. So, (laughs) you know, I, I kind of, I think it's all, it's stigma, but it's also, there's this deep human fear of losing control again of ourselves and our minds. And um, (laughs) yeah, it's it's true. And that loss of control is, is really, it's a powerful, powerful fear. Um, and it, and it does probably enact itself in ways we don't even realize for most people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I have one last question for you (laughs) and thank you for being so generous with your time and with your answers. Thank you Um, for your good questions. (laughs) Um, did anything surprise you about the process of writing this novel and releasing it into the world? Uh, well, it didn't get the reaction that I, it didn't get as much attention as my first novel. Um, and it was very poorly proofread. And that is a lot to do with my problem. Also, my computer had a problem at the time. I was, had keys that didn't work. <laughs> I had six proofreaders and I had made so many mistakes. They just couldn't catch them all. So I know that the proofreading was um, inadequate for this book um, and I think that there was little critical acclaim for it because of that but I'm sort of curious about the there's a certain amount of silence around it for me that I wasn't quite expecting because my first book there was just more a little more um, excitement about it and I think but you know um, this book low is stocked at Venus Envy which is a um, a sex positive shop in Halifax and I, it's always been I, I felt it's been well received there and among a population that um, maybe frequents that store which I love um, so I find it interesting that there's sort of more mainstream silence and then this little pocket of maybe celebration for this book if I can, I don't know if I can say celebration. I don't really know how strong, strongly people feel, but um, but I sort of feel that's different than my other books. So um, yeah, that's how it, my perception of how it's been received anyway. Well, and that's interesting about Venus Envy because it's also a very queer 
friendly store. Um, yeah. And I think the relationship between queerness and openness to madness is quite strong. Um, certainly for myself, it is. And, and I think for lots of queer folks, it is like within the queer community, I think it is in fact more accepted and more common to talk about mental health issues, to be open about many parts of one's life, not just one, one superficial identity, you know? Um, so that kind of makes sense to me in terms of its reception at a place like Venus Envy versus a, you know, a bigger box bookstore yeah yeah that's yeah I can see that and I even though I don't identify as queer I could see it as a population that has had so much of its own trauma like every queer person has probably gone through traumas related to queerness that I you know I don't have that experience but I can sort of appreciate that oh yeah that's a population that probably knows something about trauma that like the rest of the world might not dig so yeah I absolutely agree I, I think just even conversations and the discourse around trauma in queer communities is much more prevalent and much much more active and and much more uh, nuanced I would say yeah, yeah. like as a, as a general statement I right. <laughs> yeah yeah well, thank you so much, Anna. It was so nice to talk to you about low and about issues of madness in general. And I just want to thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you for this interview. And I really liked your questions and I felt I had a hard time answering some of them, but um, I really appreciate them. Thank you. Thank you.